Hi, Jane Schnupp here with another Savvy Sightseer video vacation from the Staycation series. This time we are heading up the East Coast to check out Massachusetts and its lesser known Cape Ann, about 100 miles north from the better known Cape Cod. With more than 1,500 miles of coastline, inhabitants of Massachusetts have always relied upon the region's rich maritime resources. Fishing, shipbuilding, and seafaring commerce have been a staple of the economy since the 17th century colonists first settled here. America is said to have been built on a maritime economy, and in the 1670s, Boston Harbor was considered the capital of maritime trade in colonial America. Cape Ann, about 22 nautical miles from the state's border with New Hampshire, is home to the country's oldest fishing seaport and still is a bustling hub of maritime activities. The state's northeastern region's main harbors sport all kinds of sailing vessels, including whale watching boats, pontoons, lobster boats, and tall ships that harken back to the area's roots. Part of local success back in the 17th century came from the work philosophy of trying all ports and risking all freights, meaning the rugged fishermen of Northeast Massachusetts would go anywhere and trade in anything. Some cargo that came and went were colonial produce, shipping and naval furniture, dried codfish, barreled beef, pork and lumber. More exotic items passed through towns served by local crews. Russian duck, West Indian sugar, New England rum, French brandy, tea, spices, silks, lemons, chinaware, the list is pretty endless. Boston was dubbed the market town of the West Indies. Cape Ann, named for English King Charles I's mother, Queen Anne, is actually a rocky island about 44 miles northeast of the state capital, Boston. Fishing is at its very roots. The first non-native settlers of Cape Ann arrived as part of a Dorchester Company crew from England. They had plied the fertile fish grounds off the banks of Newfoundland. In 1623, 14 men stayed on the Cape to winter over. In the county of Essex, the region's key coastal communities have become household names because of their history and movies they've been featured in, like Manchester by the Sea, Gloucester, Rockport, and the town of Essex. Even nearby Salem's fame reached far beyond its disgrace as the home of the insidious witch trials. Salem Bay was once recognized as one of the most important seaports in 18th century America. That was due largely to its very rich codfish trade with the West Indies and Europe. History on the Cape and surrounding areas is recorded in superlatives. The oldest seaport, birthplace of the U.S. Coast Guard, launch of the country's first revenue cutter, the only church steeple in the nation that's also an official navigation aid. It's where the first lobster trap was invented and the first fried clam dish was offered up. Over the years, Cape Ann developed a dual personality of sorts and became a mecca as well for artists. It is home to one of the oldest continuously operating art colonies in the United States. Adding to the region's list of superlatives, it's also where you will find the building most often captured on canvas and film by artists in this country. So get your sea legs ready and we'll hit the waves for an insider look at maritime life in Northeast Massachusetts. That 14 fishermen settlement would later become the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Initially, it was a booming lumber business from the area's lush forests that fueled the local economy year round. But as that resource dwindled, residents turned more and more to the sea. Offshore, some of the best fishing sites lie nearby, around Canada's Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, and the region became entrenched in shipmaking and fishing. The seas of the North Atlantic can be unforgiving, though, and along with the boon in fishing revenue came tragedy. Estimates of seamen lost since 1623 range between eight and 10,000. Included in that dreadful club is the six-man crew of the Andrea Gale, 
who were headed back to this port at the end of October 1991. Their faithful trip was immortalized in book and film as the perfect storm. This image of a determined fisherman sculpted for the region's 300th anniversary has become synonymous with one of Cape Ann's most famous communities, Gloucester, considered to be the birthplace of the U.S. fishing industry and our oldest fishing seaport. A similar steely-eyed, rain-slicked captain steering a fishing schooner is also the instantly recognizable logo of the Gortons of Gloucester Fish Company. Outside the corporate headquarters in Gloucester is a takeoff of The Man at the Wheel by local artist A.W. Bueller. The original, painted in 1901, was acquired by Gortons and the company adopted his likeness as their trademark in 1905. He first appeared in TV ads in 1975 and has been an American icon ever since. Adding to our list of superlatives for this region, we can note that Gorton's holds a few records of its own. The business's roots go back to a small fishing enterprise founded in 1849 by John Pugh. Over time, it was built on and merged with other area fisheries, including Slade Gorton's, eventually taking on his name for the entire business. It is considered to be one of America's oldest continually operating companies. Thanks to a collaboration with another Gloucester resident, Clarence Birdseye, who is credited with inventing in 1924 a quick freezing method, the company's signature frozen fish sticks were created and became the top fish stick brand of the United States. In 1949, the first refrigerated trailer truck with a shipment of frozen fish set out from Gloucester to San Francisco, a trip that took eight days. Today, Gorton's is one of the largest seafood suppliers in the world. And by the way, that yellow hat, known universally as a Southwester, is also a native of Cape Ann. The soft oiled canvas, longer in the back than in the front, was designed to protect the neck fully and was first recorded as being used by Gloucester fishermen in 1837. The name stems from the fact that bad weather in fishing areas around Newfoundland came from the Northwest, so to keep their faces dry, they had to look Southwest. To get a real feel for the challenges early sailors faced, take a spin on the schooner Thomas E. Lannan, named for a fisherman who worked the waters around Cape Ann from 1901 to 1943. It was built by a designer whose family has been building boats in the area for hundreds of years. It's framed with white oak and black locust from trees grown in Essex County. In the settlement's early days, fishermen used small wooden boats and stayed close to shore. By the early 1700s, searching for even more fertile grounds, they discovered a submerged sandbank southeast of Gloucester that yielded large catches of various fish. To reach these, a larger, new type of craft was needed. Boat builders experimented, and in 1713, they launched the first American schooner from Gloucester, a sleek two-masted vessel that revolutionized the fishing industry. The name reportedly comes from an old New England word schoon, meaning to skim lightly along the water. By mid-century, Gloucester was renowned for its fishing fleet, and 75 fishing schooners called the port home. They sailed for the West Indies, loaded with salt cod to feed slaves laboring on sugar plantations, and returned with holds packed full of rum, molasses, and cane sugar. The true glory days of Gloucester fishing came in the second half of the 19th century, and with a fleet of four to 500 sailing vessels, Gloucester's fishing industry was the largest of any port in America. Aboard the Lannan, energetic tourists can choose to really dig into the experience and work alongside the crew to raise the sails and man the masks. They quickly learn it takes real muscle to raise those huge sheets. Although this one is made of Dacron, lighter than canvas, it still comes in at about 250 pounds. That's a lot of hoisting. It took four people, three crew, and one brave tourist to do it. Oh, no, 
Quit complaining. Keep pulling. At the very tip of Cape Ann is the town of Rockport, which today some consider the quintessential New England coastal town. That wasn't always the case. In fact, it had originally been part of Gloucester, but only as a thick pine forest, the major source of the region's timber exporting and shipbuilding business. And so, settlements there were prohibited, and it remained uninhabited for more than a century. A dock was built in Sandy Bay in 1743 to accommodate the timber and fishing industries. As the forest became depleted in the mid to late 1700s, homesteaders started moving in. And another natural resource luckily came into play to boost the economy, granite. By the 1830s, Rockport's quarry industry was on the rise, with granite being shipped up and down the eastern seaboard for such uses as part of the Holland Tunnel. Brooklyn Bridge, and the West Point Military Academy in New York. It was also used for the Fountain Bowls in Union Station Plaza in Washington, D.C., and for paving several big city streets. One record shows 200,000 Rockport paving blocks were delivered to New York City. With increased economic importance, residents became more self-reliant and wanted to be self-governing. In 1840, they broke from Gloucester and the rest of Cape Ann, and the town became, named by a popular vote, Rockport. As the demand for granite ebbed in the early 1900s, Rockport reinvented itself yet again, this time as a thriving artist colony and summer tourist destination. One artist, Lester Hornby, offered painting classes during the summer in the early 18, 1930s. He would send students out to pick a scene to paint, whatever struck them, and then come back and share their art with the class. He quickly realized many were using the same subject for their effort. A simple red fishing shack from the 1840s at the harbor that the fledgling artist felt epitomized, a New England fishing town. Its recurring use as a thematic element led Hornsby to dub the red shack Motif Number no. 1, a name that oddly stuck. It is said to be the most reproduced subject of art. It appears even in movies, on magazine covers, postage stamps, and TV commercials. It was even replicated as a 27-foot-long float for the American Legion's convention in Chicago in 1933. Since 1945, Motif No. 1 Day is a late May festival to encourage tourism. Its 5K road race and one-mile fun run raise funds for local causes. The original building was destroyed by a blizzard in 1978, but was quickly rebuilt, right down to the deliberately weathered red paint. It now serves as a city-owned monument to the area's veterans, and, of course, as a tourist attraction and subject for artists. The burgeoning art community created challenges for local fishermen, pitting the two groups against each other. There are reports that at times fishermen would come back with their haul, only to find they couldn't unload it because the docks were filled with artists and their easels. All around the Cape are signs of the prominence of artists and their work, like this tribute to Fitzhenry Lane, well-known 19th century artist whose inspiration came from the sea. Set on a rocky ledge by his historic three-story house facing the bay in Gloucester, it reflects the artist avidly engrossed in his work, much as he would have been in his top-floor studio looking out across the harbor. The memorial, however, is a tribute not just to Lane, but also to the many others drawn to Cape Ann for the captivating views. In the mid to late 1800s, artists started converging on one of the most picturesque areas, Rocky Neck, forming an art colony recognized today as one of the oldest working art colonies in the country, a lure to artists far for more than 150 years. Even writers were drawn here, Louisa May Alcott, for one, and Rudyard Kipling, whose Captain's Courageous details life among codfishers from Gloucester. The little community reflects the artistic bent of its inhabitants with unusually crafted houses like this, the one-time home of A.W. Bueller, where the famous man at the wheel came to life. Not just the sea inspires artists, the unique architecture of the small enclave does as well. This home, was one of over a hundred local sites 
that caught the eye of and demanded reproduction by realist artist Edward Hopper. Officially titled The Mansard Roof, he dubbed the subject of his watercolor the Wedding Cake House. His version of this interesting architectural delight was Hopper's breakout creation and career maker. It earned him a showing in 1923 at the Brooklyn Museum, which also bought the painting for its permanent collection for the pricely sum of $100. On the western side of Cape Ann, facing Ipswich Bay, is another typical New England site, one of the many lighthouses dotting the coast. On Wigwam Point, so named because it was the summer meeting place of Native Americans, the 41-foot tall tower with a black lantern room protects Anasquam Harbor, just as its predecessors have since 1801, making it one of the oldest light stations in Massachusetts. Owned by the U.S. Coast Guard, Anasquam Harbor Light Station is still an active aid to navigation, although it is closed to the public. The region is credited with being the birthplace of the Coast Guard because the first revenue cutter put into service, called the Massachusetts, was built and launched in nearby Newburyport in 1791. Over in Beverly is a very different lighthouse setup. Working in tandem with a local church, the Hospital Point Light Station is the only naval navigation aid in this country employing a steeple in its system. The light station was established in 1872, but in 1927, it picked up a partner, the First Baptist Church, about a mile away. The U.S. Lighthouse Service installed what's called a rear range light, 127 feet up, in one of its steeple windows. The lighthouse itself then became the front range light, as the lowest light of the two and the one closest to ships. When a navigator lines up its light in conjunction with the steeple's rear higher light, the captain has a clear visual guide to safely traveling through the middle of the channel. In 1975, a devastating fire destroyed the church, but the rear light continued to operate because the steeple was one of the few parts of the church that survived the fire. Not surprisingly, the locals took that as a miracle. They then built a new modern church that they attached to the historic steeple. Beverly has another unusual role of maritime importance, possibly as the birthplace of the U.S. Navy. But nearby Marblehead is one of several cities saying, oh no, that honor belongs to them. Undisputed is that a schooner, the Hannah, became the first vessel that Commander George Washington of the Continental Army ordered outfitted as a warship in September 1775. The debate centers around who legitimately holds the honor of being the agency's birthplace. The fact that the ship was owned and manned by Marblehead residents is what they say gives them top dibs. But it was modified and launched in Beverly. So those residents say the title is theirs. Chiming in on the argument is Philadelphia, Pennsylvania which is where the vote to create the Navy was taken by the Continental Congress. And then there's Providence, Rhode Island, whose residents were among the first to call for the establishment of a Navy. So each says their role makes them the Navy's true home. The Navy has tried to thread the needle with these and other claimants by stating, perhaps it would be historically accurate to say that America's Navy had many birthplaces. This scenic stretch of shore along Massachusetts Bay from Salem to Gloucester should look familiar to many. Hollywood loves to use the towns of Salem, Beverly, Marblehead, as well as Manchester by the Sea and Gloucester in its films. The list is pretty long and includes The Perfect Storm, Hocus Pocus, Coda, and of course the self-titled Manchester by the Sea star starring Casey Affleck. Though for some reason, the production company dropped the town's hyphens, originally added with By the Sea in 1989 to differentiate it from Manchester, New Hampshire. The fertile waters off Cape Ann are the feeding grounds for some pretty big prey and another one-time boon to the local maritime economy. Whales. People have been whaling for thousands of years. Cape Ann just so happens to be located directly between two major whale feeding areas, 
Stellwagen Bank, and Jeffrey's Ledge. During the Middle Ages and Renaissance, whaling gained popularity throughout Northern Europe. Over time, European whaling ventures spread to North America. American colonists relied on whale blubber oil to light most of their lamps. But a whale was the gift that kept on giving. Nearly every part of the mammal was used. Meat, skin, blubber, and organs were eaten as an important source of protein, fats, vitamins, and minerals. Baleen, or whalebone, was woven into baskets and used as fishing line, as well as for tool making, corsets, hoop skirts, and carving ceremonial items such as masks. In warmer climates, it was also used as a roofing material. And it was sperm whale oil that Gloucester seafarers rubbed into their yellow slickers and sou'westers to waterproof them. In the early days of whaling, lookouts on shore alerted fishermen when a whale was sighted. A crew of four, loaded up with harpoons and lances, rowed out to the whale so the harpooner could catch it and spear it. The whale was towed back to shore for processing. By the mid-1700s, it became increasingly difficult to find whales near the Atlantic coast, so New England mar mariners took to sailing away from shore in search of whales. For this, though, they needed more sophisticated vessels. With ships built in the area, largely in the town of Essex, they were able to go farther afield for longer. They went as far away as the Arctic, South Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans and the work of processing the huge animals was done right on board the ship. Whaling promoted other adjacent industries. Initially, that involved shipbuilding, sail, and rope making, but evolved over time to include new technologies, such as gun-loaded harpoons and steamships. Whaling became a multi-million dollar industry. But those extended voyages led to a very different type of life for local fishermen who set out sometimes for over 40 months at a pop. They found some things to do with their spare time on board. Whaleboat races were a highlight when two ships encountered each other. Many sailors became pretty good artists using whale teeth and bones for their canvas and etched scrimshaw gifts for family members, sweethearts, and friends. Any guesses? as to what that one in the upper right-hand corner is? Well, if you guessed that it was an unusual pie crust crimper, you were right. The men would also entertain themselves with composing and singing sea shanties or a work song to accompany rhythmical labor aboard. This particular one from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History is an outward bound shanty that talks about shipboard activities undertaken when leaving port, as well as the hardships of saying goodbye to those they were leaving behind. I'll sing you a song, a good song of the sea. Away, Rio! I'll sing you a song if you'll sing it with me. We're bound for Rio Grande, and it's away. Captain and runner around away, Rio. We'll haul up the anchor to this jolly sound, cause we're bound for the Rio Grande, and it's away, Rio. Away, Rio. It's fair, you well, my pretty young girls, cause we're bound for the Rio Grande. I guarantee at least one of you will find yourself humming away, Rio, at some point. Whaling in the United States hit its peak in the mid-1800s. Demand for whale products had started to fall as kerosene, petroleum, and other fossil fuels became much more popular and reliable than whale oil. However, the industry faced a larger challenge, overhunting. By the mid-20th century, most species of large whale were being rapidly pushed toward extinction. The U.S. officially outlawed whaling in 1971, but
but it wasn't until 1982 that the International Whaling Commission voted to ban commercial whaling. Most countries adhere to the worldwide edict that went into effect in 1986, willingly foregoing the income from whaling. But, as they say, when a door is closed, a window opens, and Cape Ann's captains turn to a new maritime moneymaker. Whale Watch Cruising After noticing guests on his fishing charters were bedazzled whenever a whale would breach the surface, Captain Al Avalar decided to change the nature of his voyages. In 1975, the Massachusetts man set out with some school children on the first whale-watching trip on the eastern seaboard of the United States. He then established the first whale-watching company on the Atlantic coast and began to expand his fleet, adding vessels especially designed for viewing whales. The industry flourished all along the Massachusetts coast, from Cape Ann to Cape Cod. Today, over a million people a year view the mass of beings between April and October. So, decades after the region's whaling industry disappeared, whale watching is a close to $200 million business in New England. In 1992, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary was created off the coast of Cape Ann. It encompasses 842 square miles of some of the most productive ocean waters anywhere in the Northwest Atlantic. Since it's protected sanctuary, a wide variety of whale species migrate to the coast of Gloucester every year to feed on the abundant natural resources. The region has been deemed one of the top five whale watching destinations in the world by the World Wildlife Fund. And captains assure tourists they can provide guaranteed whale sightings for every whale watching tour. Hopefully, catching a view like this of four humpbacks feeding at Stellwagen Bank. Not like the one I got, only of this teaser who repeatedly surfaced, but just barely, before giving a little wave goodbye with its tail. Protecting the whales, and of course, the multi-millions in revenue brought by tourists to the region, has sparked some controversy with another lucrative fishing industry operating off Cape Ann, lobstering. It's interesting how businesses and tastes change over time, and the lobster industry is a case in point. Back in the 1700s, the crustaceans were considered a poor man's food, not the valued commodity it is today. Then, lobsters were often found washed up on the beach at low tide or after large storms. Some fishermen hunted for lobsters by torchlight on calm evenings, spearing them as they crawled around in search of food. Although there was not a commercial market for lobster at this time, some fishermen managed to sell their catch, but not for very much. All that changed in 1808, when Ebenezer Thorndike, a shoemaker who also had a dried fish business and a fish market, had a brilliant idea. The Essex County native developed the first lobster trap and is credited with radically transforming lobster fishing. The lobster pots are dropped on the sea floor attached to a floating buoy marking the spot. Each person's buoys are color-coded and uniquely patterned, which must be registered. No two lobster hunters are allowed to use the same buoy configuration. The issue is the rope used to connect buoy to trap. Whale proponents contend the whales can get caught in the trap lines, but lobstermen say the whales are in more danger from boat propellers. However, state officials are siding with the whales and actively discouraging lobster harvesting, as well as enforcing an outright ban on traps being laid, even in coves, from February until May each year when the whales migrate to the area. Other rules limit the industry. This little guy pulled up on my lobster trip from Gloucester was a bit too small and ultimately was sent back on his merry way. Typically, the lobster you could pick up locally would be between one and five pounds, a far cry from the one reportedly caught off the coast of Nova Scotia in 1977. That one found his way into the Guinness Book of World Records when he weighed in at 44.6 pounds. The three and a half foot long sea dweller was estimated to be over a century old before he was sold off to a local restaurant. It's possible he was not the largest haul ever though. In 1926, a more than 
50 pounder was said to have been brought in from the main coast. But a grainy photo of the mounted crustacean with 50 inch claws was not enough to warrant him an official spot in the record books. As the story goes, he was being driven to a private museum, but was damaged during the bumpy drive. But perhaps that's just one of the many popular fish tales from the area. About six miles due west of Gloucester is another important coastal town, but its prominence came mainly not from fishing itself, but from being the bedrock of the fishing industry. Since the 1630s, the town of Essex's shipbuilding prowess was praised all over the East Coast for unsurpassed skill and craftsmanship. More than 4,000 wooden vessels were produced from about 14 shipyards in the small marshland community, which was also the leading supplier of schooners for Gloucester. Once completed, a vessel could sail down the Essex River, out into Essex Bay, and on to Ipswich Bay, past Wigwam Point and Rockport, and then out into the Atlantic. A boatyard, owned by generations of the Story family, still constructs and launches classic wooden ships built in the Essex tradition. And it was in es Essex where the schooner Thomas E. Lannan, which you saw earlier, was built in 1997 by Harold Burnham, an 11th generation shipbuilder whose family had been crafting wooden fishing schooners in Essex since 1650. A modern pontoon boat is a lovely way to sail along the estuary to catch sight of some mansions, both off and on the water. Well, maybe not everyone has the same definition for mansion, but this owner certainly believes his is a castle in its own right. It's also historic in that it is the last of its kind. Essex River is a very big clamming area, but with 25 to 30 houseboats sharing the estuary at one point, it was decided the floating residences, with their lack of safe waste disposal, had to be the ones to go. This is the last permitted houseboat, and once it's no longer seaworthy, it will be removed. With no new permits being issued, it will be the end of their era. I mentioned the town of Essex was known as a shipbuilding center, but it also became famous for another reason. Some people, when they find themselves with an abundance of lemons, make lemonade. For Lawrence Chubby Woodman, one slow day in 1916 at his roadside concession stand in Essex left him with too many of his hand-dug clams going on board. A friend jokingly suggested, why don't you fry up some of your clams? If they're as tasty as those potato chips of yours, you'll never have to worry about having enough customers. Well, truer words have never been said. Chubby took up his friend's challenge, shucked a few of the mollusks, dipped them in batters, and threw them into the potato chip fryer, and voila, invented the fried clam. The next day, during the 4th of July parade, Chubby and his wife Bessie unveiled the previously unheard of delicacy, and the citizens of Essex got the world's first taste of fried clams, to resounding success. Even Howard Johnson, then owner of a chain of restaurants in his name, went to Woodman's to learn how to make the popular dish directly from Chubby. Today, they are still a top seller at the family-run business on Main Street, which has even gotten acclaim from such connoisseurs as the Zagat Restaurant Guide. It contends Woodman's is an American cult classic, right up there with baseball and apple pie. So which claim to fame do you think is higher on your list of legacy builders? Boat crafting? or frying clams. We've all heard the saying, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning. Well, turns out the fishing industry is submerged in superstition, and there are many more adages to add to the list. For one, Lucille Ball would have been banned on old sailing trips for two reasons. Redheads were considered fiery personalities, and so were bad luck. And women were believed to distract the men as well as make the seas angry, resulting in dangerous voyages. So for the feminine touch, sailors had to suffice with naming their boats after females and attaching elaborate buxom figureheads to the bows. 
When climbing aboard a boat, always lead with your right foot. Your left foot supposedly brings bad luck for the journey ahead. Putting your right foot forward ensures the trip will start and finish the right way. And whistling while working? Well, blowing while you're standing on a boat will stir up the wind and therefore the seas. Why does Friday get a bad rap among sailors? It is probably because it was the day of the crucifixion, and by and large, old-time sailors were a religious group. Actors may prefer you say break a leg instead of good luck, believing they would get the opposite if you don't. Sailors think saying goodbye automatically dooms the voyage, keeping the ship from returning to shore. Many won't even let loved ones wave them off from the dock. And what about seaworthy cats? Well, bring them along. Rats attracted to the food cargo often invaded trading ships of old. They carried with them disease plus gnawed on the ropes, but cats love to catch rats. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to that, always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. I hope this exploration of our maritime roots has given you a true understanding of the industry and appreciation for the people that helped build our country. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website, which is also where you can visit any of my European destinations for lovely pictures and interesting commentary. And don't forget to check my programs tab to see flyers about each of my programs available in video format, as well as listing which ones I'll be presenting in person and where. I wish you all the very best for smooth sailing ahead.